welcome back to the Astro Athens channel. I am so excited to introduce today's guest to you all. Her name is Danielle Jones, and she has such a list of a history um, of everything that she's done and that she is doing, and then also what she's planning on doing. She's actually the ambassador for NASA. She also is a physicist, a scientist, and is a makeup artist. So I'm really excited today. We're gonna to be talking about the Parker Solar Probe. So hello, Danielle. Thank you for joining Hi. us. I know, it's nice to finally meet you. I feel like it's been so long. So I know, it's, it's been a while. So we've <laughs> like been connected through Instagram for quite a while and we haven't actually had to really hang out or talk or anything. So I know, but this is fun, this is good. Yeah, I I'm really, really proud of it. Especially, you're the one who told me about the Parker Solar Probe in the beginning. Right. So I'm right. so excited. When exactly is the launch going to be? Okay, so basically this probe, um, it's actually the first spacecraft that was named after a living person, um, Eugene Parker. And in the 1950s, he's a, he was a physicist, a very young physicist, and he was the first person to start theorizing things about the sun. Because to this day, I mean, we still don't know much about the sun, um, particularly the corona, which is, we talked a lot about that um, during the eclipse, because that's a particularly great time to study it. Um, so he wanted to know more about, uh, so about space weather and it, its effect on us. And he theorized that the, that the corona was actually way hotter than the center plasma of the sun, which is kind of a mind bender to think about. And so this is about 60 years ago. So this is a mission 60 years in the making. And the problem is, is that we haven't had the instrumentation to study uh, the sun like this, because what's going to withstand temperatures of, you know, hypothetically a million degrees. Um, so it's going to be launching. There's a launch window um, that's kind of two months long. It's from July 31st to August 19th. It's at Kennedy Space Center. I encourage anybody who, I mean, take a vacation down there and go see it if you can, because seeing a launch is something you will uh, never, ever forget, especially this one. Um, it's going to be going on a Delta IV Heavy because it has to get out of here really, really quickly, right? That, to me, is the most exciting part. Um, it's kind of how, it's kind of amazing that something that I've seen in person can go up to and study the sun in such a momentous, I mean, and go so quickly. It's just, I mean, even today, studying what I do every single day, it's watching launches. I mean, you know, watching anything, especially the SpaceX stuff lately, it just, it humbles you in, in such a way. So um, when we talk about this mission, it's, though it hasn't really been spoken about a lot, this is kind of, in, in my opinion, the caliber of the discoveries like Hubble made. I mean, this is, this is the first time that we're getting this close to the sun by a large margin. And um, I'm just like beside myself. Um, I can't wait till we start getting data back. So this is so exciting. This is actually the first mission that NASA's having going to the right. sun, right? And, and right. Or is it actually gonna be touching the surface? And if so, just how deep is it going to be uh, going? Well, it, basically in the final three passes that it's gonna make, um, we're gonna get about 3.8 million miles from the sun. Uh, and then they're gonna shut it off. So it, probably evaporate. Um, it's extremely warm. So uh, we're getting pretty close and obviously the closest that any spacecraft has ever been. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so it's going like, like that is so close, like 3.5 million miles. I know for a lot of us might seem like that's really long, but to get that close to the sun, that is incredible. And so is that the point that it can reach where then it, it won't, it's close to evaporating, but it won't from the heat? Right, right. And, and that's the biggest question every, anytime I ever talk about this is how are we sending anything that can get even remotely close to the sun without it just disappearing into smoke? Well, over the past 60 years, like I mentioned, they've developed this composite carbon shield. It's just a shield to shield this um, spacecraft from the heat. And basically, um, this shield will make the rest of the spacecraft, most of the instrumentation, there's a couple things in the instrumentation that need to be exposed to the radiation, um, but it will make the rest of it room temperature, like 68 degrees. Wow. Yeah. That's and, incredible. 
Well, and because of the density, like I was talking about earlier, it's actually not as hot as, uh, as you would think it would be. It's kind of like if you set your oven to 450 degrees. If you touch the coil, you'll get burned. But if you could stick your hand in there for a while and you'd probably be okay. You know, I mean, I don't suggest you do that. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like uh, sunlight. So the actual shield is taking in about 2,500 degrees and then diverting it, and then the rest of the spacecraft would be at 68 degrees. Wow. That yeah. is so cool. I could totally use that like when I go to the beach because I'm not one of those people that can tan. I turn into my cool. so. I know, and I think that that's kind of the most amazing thing that we get out of missions. Of course, the inline, you know, finding out um, about space weather, how to uh, trace how energy and heat move through the solar corona. These things are very important but we're also inventing all this amazing technology to get to this point. I mean, just look at, you know, when we went to the moon, all the things that we invented in that process. And that's kind of uh, the basis of when I do my speeches and stuff, why I talk about why these missions are important. Why do we care? Of course, in line, very important. But like that shield, you never would have imagined that it had a shield that converted it into some kind of thermal, um, protecting it's like out of a fairy tale it's pretty amazing yeah I love that and that actually just jumped into my next question too which is like why even go to the Sun in the first place and I think you brought up some very valid points with mm -hmm. a lot of the technology that comes out of these NASA missions really do become applicable to our everyday lives here on earth and I absolutely right. love that you brought that up um, I do want to ask what some of the things that we're searching for um, at the Sun you mentioned solar weather was that mm -hmm. correct as far as like for space travel for astronauts what else? There you go. Yes, Th that's another reason why this is really important because we don't know a lot about how the sun behaves and how that's going to affect us. Like we're talking about communication systems that get knocked out, um, the astronauts, um, how they're affected by solar weather, um, things like that are really important to study. And the only way we can study it is with a mission like this. Um, we don't know a lot about solar energy particles, how they're made, why they do what they do. And, you know, this is the first time that we have the technology to be able to do it. Um, and thermal engineering has expanded so much in the past 60 years. Um, and it's, I, I can't wait for us to get kind of uh, the first set of data back from it. Um, we're going to be studying magnetic fields, plasma and energy particles, and also um, imaging the solar winds, which if you've ever watched, I know you have, if you've ever watched a video of the sun, Mm -hmm. I find it captivating just to just to see that just like gurgling ball of plasmic hot energy because when you look at up in the sky you don't really see that you know yeah. and how many civilizations have based themselves on the sun and stories about the sun and now we get to actually go there and see it it's just kind of remarkable that's so cool and uh speaking of going there and seeing it my last question on the solar probe would be uh so how can people go to aboard this mission <laughs> well it closed last week oh no but, okay no, no but the good news is though the good news is though is that 1.1 million people put their names into nasa had a database type thing where you could put your name in or someone else's name i did mine and my daughter's and you get a little certificate and say that you're sending it um, aboard the probe to the sun. It was kind of their way of introducing the public to this mission and, um, and to let them know how important it was. Because I think it seems very simple. The sun seems very simple, but it's actually extremely complex and there's so much we don't know about it. I mean, it's the source of the heat for life and the more we know about it the more we can understand how we benefit from it and even how life has developed on earth because of it so um you know it, yeah. it's amazing yeah i think that yeah. it's a <laughs> back down to to humanity um that little bit of like wow i too get to be part of this research even though like you know you're not obviously directly going to the sun putting your name there is it still says something it's like people who like name a star after their loved one and actually that's what i wanted to bring up too is that the sun is a star so like 
you know, by doing this, we're going to be able to understand things about other, like, um, um, main sequence stars, which is what our sun is, by the way, for those right. that you know. And I think that that's so cool, because then we'll be able to understand possibly how other, like, yeah, like, uh, exoplanetary systems might form around their stars. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, and in our solar system, you know, obviously it's the only star that we have the opportunity to study so far. You know, who knows, in our lifetime, 60 more years. But um, no, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just kind of insane, especially if you study a lot about magnetic fields and how those work. I mean, it's just, it, it, the thing about solar exploration to me is just these ideas of wonder and kind of what is out there and what are these things, what are these subjects? We don't even know the science. It's not even, you know what I mean? Like these new fields of science that are gonna come from this. Like people like me, smile like this because we know that it's the beginning of a whole new chapter in science and what we know um, about how our solar system works. So I'm yeah. really happy to talk about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And that actually segues away perfectly into my next question, which is, why did you first start getting involved in science? And this is the, the portion I want to like interview you, Danielle. Like, what exactly like really motivated? Nobody wants to know about me. It's crazy. No. Um, <laughs> oh, wow, science. I think I was trying to think um, last night about what got me into science. I think it's just as a kid, I was always very inventive and very, um, I, I, I kind of kept to myself. I had a really hard time in school. It's kind of a common story. Um, and I, I love to research. I didn't like to read necessarily, but I did love to know how things worked. So back when my parents got a, uh, the first computer we got as a family, it was like an e-machine, which is like old floppy disks and things like that. And floppy disks got stuck in there. And my, stepped out was like oh we have to throw it away blah, blah blah and i was devastated because how else would i paint without it and so i bought um or rented a manual from the library and took the whole thing apart got it out cleaned it out put it back together and it worked wow and i think somehow that clicked in my head of like now i have to take apart the toaster and now i have to you know figure out how my mom's car works and it started this thing. And I just, and I also think I just love being around scientists because I think they're the most fascinating people in the entire world. People who always ask why and people who are a source for knowledge about why is, it keeps you alive, you know? So. Yeah, I love that. I feel the same exact way, which is why um, I, I also am I'm constantly surrounding myself with scientists and I love interviewing people because you hear so much from them that maybe we didn't know. So I, I love that, that that's really what uh, was like snowball effects for you that really turned you into actually right. go more into science. How mm -hmm. did you first start getting involved with NASA as their ambassador? Like that is such a great title. <laughs> The ambassador. I know. Well, it's, and it's like solar system ambassador, as if like the rest of all of the planets are waiting on me on bated breath to speak. But um, no, I mean, I think I was just honestly anything, any big successes that I feel like I've had, and I always say this. I mean, a lot of it is hard work. I don't ever want to downplay hard work, but I think that being in the right place at the right time, and also being uh, receptive and positive and nice to everyone is always a really big thing. If you ever want to get involved with, especially with the public, and you want to do well at it, um, meeting these people, forming relationships with them online, finding people who are like you, um, you know, um, as, as well as I do, that it's really easy to talk to astronauts because they love talking about what they do. So I think that starting getting out of college I was a nurse for a little bit um I didn't really I love my patients I didn't like the uh I don't know politics of the hospital and things like that and I always you know I had my degree and I just didn't wasn't doing anything with it I used to be a pageant girl didn't do well at it but I loved talking on stage so I thought how do I morph these things together and I fell into the ambassador program and so um, we ambassadors are, we harbor all of this um, mission 
information. We sit in teleconferences and learn about every mission that's going to happen. Um, we're able to attend, you know, launches and public events. Like I ran the Earth Science booth at uh, the Engineering and Science Festival here in DC. And I got to show kids in the VR glasses uh, soaring above Earth. And we talked about Landsat data and spectrography and uh, just being able to take what I love and share it with people, no matter what their age or knowledge of science is, is like a dream come true. So that's a very long answer to your question, but I just fell into it and I love it. I love it. Right. Oh, I, I think that's so neat. And it really, I have to agree with you. It has to really be the, the right timing for yourself and uh, the right place and the people that you meet. Um, I'm constantly um, an advocate for saying that, you know, you have to be in a community. We have to find our people and find people that agree with you and feel like same or like those that challenge you. And um, yes. I definitely agree with that. So I'm so happy you're able to find that. Um, I'm really curious because your name on Instagram is physicist MUA. And for those of you guys that don't know, MUA is an acronym for makeup artist. So I want to know all about like when you first started becoming a makeup artist and where your creative spark really started for that mm -hmm. I know you said you were doing pageants uh, yeah I think I think most scientists have some kind of artistic output somewhere and it might not translate that like literally but like you have have your form of art and I think that everyone has to exercise that part of their brain somehow in in, in some fashion so for me being a pageant girl, I think the part I liked about it was the transformation. And in college, I used to work at a uh, bar that uh, had drag shows. And so I, yeah, and I worked doing makeup for them and learning things. And it helped my pageant career a lot because it's a lot about illusion and lighting. And um, I was fascinated by it. So I started working and I had friends that were asking me to do their makeup for their weddings or for pageants and things and I just started doing it to make money on the side in college because you know broke <laughs> and um I I love it and I still do it from time to time for friends weddings or baby showers or whatever and um, I'm a makeup product junkie thank goodness you can't see what's this way <laughs> it's just my form of I don't know relaxation but now I can you know build a vanity and install the light. <laughs> And I have the equipment to do more with it than uh, I intended to. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just a really good outlet for, for somebody. And I like making people feel good about themselves or yeah, you know, for a day. You know, it's not everything. Makeup isn't everything. I usually don't wear it because I don't have the time anymore. But, you know, I don't know. It's fun. Yeah. yeah, well, I do love that. And I think it's so special too that you have that because, you know, a lot of us see like on Instagram, YouTube, there's a lot of makeup, like beauty influencers. And I love that it's like you have that, but you're a science influencer through being a NASA mm -hmm. ambassador. And I love that, you know, and now we were discussing earlier, you, you know, you're looking into potentially recording videos, is it, and for doing makeup tutorials? Some, I want to figure out, I was thinking about doing kind of a series like the science of makeup or skincare and yeah. talking about, do you know what I mean? Because I think a lot of people want to know why things work, if things are ripoffs or if they're not, um, what ingredients are active, what aren't. I mean, I'm not a chemist, but I'm obviously fairly familiar with things like that. Um, and I've worked with a lot of this stuff um, before and maybe even like the history of makeup, you know, where it comes from. And um, I don't know, I think it's always a good thing to know more about something. Yeah. I, I'm one of those people, and I think you are too, I don't know this, but I will fall down Google holes so far that it will, I will look at, uh, I don't know, the history of makeup or chemistry of makeup. I'll be on Google for probably six hours, just like 10 inches deep and like, oh, mascara was made by this person and this ingredient and for this purpose, but it was really meant for this. And I, now I just know things. So, you know, so if you yeah. need somebody on your trivia team, 
It's me. Yeah, that would be so cool. Oh my gosh. Well, if you end up knowing that and we end up playing trivia, I would definitely turn to you for any of uh, that information. Um, I really hope you end up actually doing that and, and making videos. I think that would be a huge hit and people would love that because it, it's, like you said, it's an educational aspect of that. And I think that um, definitely it's something. Yeah. Um, I think, um, and, and for my science more, you know, I think I would do that for just something fun to just put out into the universe. And I'm like, if one person watches it, I'm fine. Um, but professionally, you know, my ultimate, ultimate goal is to own a mobile planetarium. That would be, and so I could do what I do and take that to schools, especially kids who, you know, a lot of the times when I speak to schools, cause that's primarily what I do as an ambassador, different ambassadors have different kind of objectives for me. I love talking to kids because they are not jaded by anything, you know, watching their eyes just fall open when you tell them about how many galaxies there are and how many stars there are and what, how many planets there probably is. I mean, you know, you, you think um, it makes their world so much bigger. And when you do that to a kid, who knows where they're going to go? And some of these kids don't have voices like that, you know, and teachers are exhausted. So it's nice to go in and give them a day off and um, kind of occupy their kids. But ideally, you know, I would love to go, especially to schools that don't have funding, because a big part of what I do is I kind of look for um, schools between where I usually work, Kansas City and here, DC, and there are many that are extremely underfunded. The teachers are stretched so thin. Um, they can't even afford more than a microscope per one class of, you know, 35, 40 kids. Wow. Yeah. So to be able to own something like a planetarium, a mobile planetarium or something similar and have those kids have this experience, I feel like would be so special for them. And then for me, it's endlessly giving. I love, I love what I do. I love talking to kids. They ask you the most amazing and complicated questions ever and make me feel like I know absolutely nothing, so. Yeah, well, I'm really excited for you to get a mobile planet camera. I, I definitely see it happening. I 100% see you doing that. And um, if there's only, if there's one last question I could ask you, it would be, what's your main takeaway and purpose for education, for especially the youth? What is the main purpose for you as to doing that? I think why I focused on that, because I think it's, uh, I don't want to say easy, but I think it's kind of um, typical to say, oh, astrophysics is extremely, extremely complicated. So I just think I'm going to talk to college kids or adults because they're there. I don't have to backtrack. They get me on this level. But for me, uh, I think that people who are talented at speaking with kids should do it or working with kids should do it because they're the next generation. They are the Mars generation, as we're calling them. And we have to spark that, that thing inside them that lets them get there, because I think there's a lot in this world that people are feeling overwhelmed by now, particularly as far as um, science and budgets and things are concerned, but we have to get these kids on the same page. I mean, now we have coding classes. My daughter's gonna be in kindergarten in a year, and they have coding in kindergarten and first grade now, because, that's the ground level now. You know, when we were in school, we took typing until we were 18, and then they're like, see ya. And now they're like, oh, you need to program this robot to go get you something, you know, before That's you learn. Amazing. I didn't know that. A kindergarten. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's, I mean, and it's this constant feeling of you have to give your kids tools, especially women. And I think now, Obviously, there's amazing women in, in, in every NASA program, but growing up, we didn't see very many examples of that. Um, I mean, you know, you watch documentaries like the Mercury 13, and you can see why that happens. So now it's important for me also as a woman to be a visible person and a positive influence for little girls um, and little boys, but uh, to, to show them that it, the, the, there are no limits. And if you want to be a part of an organization like NASA, you don't have to work for them. You can be a citizen scientist. You know, citizen scientists discover a lot of the uh, near-Earth near objects um, that we get in because there's no way that we could possibly catch them all. So 
in order for us to keep doing this, we have to inspire these people when they're little. And, um, you know, just, and I do test things out on my daughter. She's four. And I do try and see kind of where the attention span lies. But I just, I don't know. I just think it's so important, especially if we want to get to Mars and we want to also come back, which would be better. But <laughs> for sure. Wow. Well, I love all of that information that you just shared with me and everyone who's going to be watching this video. Um, I'm very excited. Again, the launch for the Parker Solar Probe is going to be 31st through August 9th or July 31st. Okay, right, four weeks. Four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So it's, I mean, yeah. And, I, and you know, it's just depending on no, no launches ever on time. So. Yeah. That's why I was like, oh, four month launch window. Okay. I guess that's typical. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. It's, yeah. it's supposed to launch in about 90 days. Okay. So, amazing. Yeah. That's, I think, a little more streamlined. Awesome. But, so everyone yeah. needs to keep an eye out for that. And mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye out for you to have that mobile planetarium one day. I really one day. Yeah. Or work at Griffith as like one of the planetarium leaders and be super dramatic. But I'm so tiny, I think I would scare people. I'm not sure. What? No. Just just get out here. You, you'll be able to go to Griffith. I think that'd be awesome. I love it. I've been there. It was great. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Danielle. I'm really happy we got to do this. And uh, where can everyone find you if they wanted to learn more? Okay. Um, my Instagram is at physicistmua. Um, I'm sure she'll link below or something. Um, physicistmua.com. Everything is physicistmua. If you Google it, you will find me in some capacity. And I take, I can help you with anything. I can help you get involved with things. I can help you with scholarships. Um, I can help get your kids motivated for school. I'm here for whatever. I love it. And um, I can't wait. So exciting. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm so Thanks. happy to finally meet you. Yeah. I'm so, like, so happy I got to meet you too. I know. I feel like we're like very distant soulmates of some kind. So I'm <laughs> glad. I love, it. I love it. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, and I will catch you next time.